Today will be fun or a complete disaster, one of which I think it will be entertaining either way. So we were trying to talk about, uh, last week we, we were discussing about the assembly language. Uh, we were seeing the types of instructions, uh, R types, uh, I types, J types. And then we said, hey, the entire thing makes sense if we can actually make common uh, programming structures uh, be implemented with the type of instructions we have seen. All these R types things don't mean much if I cannot map programs to it. And I was promising you that today I will manage to finish uh, this story. And we started with uh, some simple con constructs like, hey, can we do branches? Can we do uh, if then else uh, statements? Then we said, can we do while loops? If you can do while loops, can we do for loops? And then we went into arrays, and then we were talking about it. Then the, the interesting part is, can we do some functions? Because I realized that if the program is going one way, and if I have one single program, I could do things. And uh, what we were discussing in a number of ways was that we were always operating on what we call um, uh, what we call those registers. So we didn't have access to the entire memory, but we had only access uh, directly to a set of 32 registers. 32, 32-bit values were immediately available for us to do some operation. If we needed something from the memory of which I can have billions of words stored somewhere, I could have a lot of them. The only problem is I cannot access them very fast. So to have a compromise, risk-like architectures, copy from the memory into those registers, then work on the registers quickly, and then copy it back to the memory. And um, we said, yeah, OK, I mean, we can do a number of things. But we realized that, or hopefully I mean, there were some questions coming and saying, how do you deal with only like 32 registers? I mean, what can we do? What happens if we want to overwrite them? So we were at that point. And we first started discussing about this caller and callee thing. So there are uh, procedures. The one procedure calls the other one. We call it the caller. And the person who gets called is uh, referred to as callee. And uh, we said, OK, uh, what happens between them? The caller passes arguments to the callee and waits until uh, the, 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 uh, the other procedure completes. Meaning that uh, he jumps, he says, I'm, I want to continue what I want to do, but first let us finish this procedure. So execution jumps to the other part. We knew that uh, there is something we call the program counter, which tells us where the next instruction is. So essentially, we are in this procedure, and we decide that we need to go to the next one. And for this, the program counter is modified through a jump instruction, and we end up at the next place. Now, when we are in the callee, we have to first understand what he wanted from us. Like We have some arguments that came to us, maybe, maybe zero, maybe more. And then we perform the procedure, and then we have to go back to where we came from. Now, there are a couple of issues that we have to be careful of. First of all, the function that we are call calling could be called from a number of different places under a number of different contexts. So we have to know where we go back. It's not always the same uh, place we came back from where we have to go back. Uh, sorry, it's not always the same uh, place where we are called from. When we go back, we have to know was I called from here? Was I called from this part of the program? Was I called from somewhere completely different? So I have to know where I have to return. The next problem is, at any point, we have these 32 registers, and uh, we shouldn't be modifying things that um, you know, was there prior to when my process was being called. So we need to agree on some conventions. And uh, the MIPS has made some agreements already for the programmers and said, you know, let's, let's agree on this. I have 32 registers, it's a lot. So let's make sure that we have the arguments in these special registers and my return values in this particular register. 
Let's agree on this. If we agree on this, every software written and compiled for the same architecture would follow the same convention. So we don't need to have some additional figuring it out, like, okay, you know, Frank compiles it this way, uh, whereas Onur compiles it a completely different way. What, what am I doing? And um, here was a very simple example where the main function calls another one without doing anything, without any arguments. And we saw that the data is actually somewhere in our address range in the memory. And every instruction has an address. And what we do is we have this jump and link instruction, uh, which does two things at the same time. A, the next, when you are at the first line there, jump and link simple, will make sure that the next time the program counter will point to this location. So this will be the next instruction that we run, the next instruction we execute. At the same time, he will save the return address. The return address is the address where it would go to if it didn't make the jump, the next address. So we were at 00400, 200. The next address is 00400, 204. We are going by four because we are talking about a word, a byte address memory, not word address memory. And when we come in here, normally we would have done a number of things. But this is a toy example. We are doing nothing. We arrive here. The moment we arrive, we return. Where do we return? Well, we know the address to return to was stored in the return address. How did I store it there? Well, I made one special instruction that not only jumped, but while he's jumping also cheated and copied the return address into the RA register. It's a part of the instruction. And we did this, or the MIPS people did this, because they realized we do this a lot. Now, what happens if I have, um, what if I have uh, some, some arguments? Well, then we say we would be, just a second. So this is the last thing that we covered. What happens if my function has a number of arguments? In this case, I have four arguments. I want to pass it to this function, which will have its code located somewhere in the memory, not directly here. So there will be something before, there will be something after. And at some point, I have this function. And when I go there, I want to be operating on this. And we briefly discuss what is happening here. And we say, OK, we have to organize the arguments. We are pushing these constants to a0, a1, a2, a3. Why those four? Because that was a convention up to four arguments I could pass like that. Those registers are there to pass it as an argument. What happens if you don't do that? Well, police, MIPS police is going to come and arrest you, okay? And then I jump and link to these default sums. Now the operation continues here. I'm not executing this yet until I am done with this. And now I have these things. So I do a0, a1 to t0, a2, a3 to t1. Uh, modify S0, subtract it, then I move S0 to V0. We are talking about look strange, but whatever, I could do that. And now I am done. I make my jump back, and the return address would be pointing to here, and I know that I should be going back there. And then I would continue. Now, the argument here was that the part of default sums was modifying a number of things. It is OK to modify v0, because by convention, we said that this is a thing that uh, you know, should contain the return value. So the return value should be fair game. But I'm also modifying a bunch of other things. So uh, what is happening? And no matter how you look at it, we will run out of registers at some point, because default sums could call another one, and that other one could call another one. At some point, we are going to run out. Actually, we are going to run out very quickly. So the idea is that we have something that we call the stack. And the stack is not in the processor. The stack is in the memory. So in the memory, we reserve an area. And this area is a dynamic, uh, a dynam dynamic place where we can put as much as we can. And uh, it's a stack of dishes, and it uses the last in, first out principle. 
So we have, uh, you know, we have some data here that we can no longer hold in our hands. So we say, okay, I'll take it and I'll put it on the stack. So that. Then I have some more. I say, okay, I put the next one. Then I have some more. I put the next one. And then the next one. And when I need it, I go and pick them the same order that I put them back. So I first take this back, then I take this back, then I take this back. So the stack keeps on contracting and expanding as we put more things, or once we are done, as we remove things. So it expands, uses more memory when more space is needed, contracts, uses less memory when some uh, space is needed. Now, this is again a convention. It could have been organized differently, but in most places, including the MIPS, uh, there is a location, there is a memory location that is already allocated for the top of the stack. And unlike what I showed, the stack grows by convention uh, to the bottom. So instead of increasing, it goes to the bottom. So what happens is, this was the stack pointer tells you what, what is the top of the stack. And then if you want to put something else, well, we first need to make some room. We modify the stack pointer and say, you know what, we were here, let's move it to here. That creates us two new locations and I can put whatever I want. Since I put them, once I'm done, I will just remove them and everything will be done. That's the trick that we are employing. Any questions so far? And the great news about this is, once I put things on the stack, how do I remove them? Well, I don't re really need to physically go and destroy them. I can just tell where the stack is. So the stack pointer I moved here, I'll just move it back up. So next time I use a stack, I'm just going to overwrite whatever was left there. So one question that a number of you can ask is, Frank, but you know, if you keep on putting things here, will we run out of memory? Yes, we will. And when that happens, we call Stack Overflow, exactly. And then you, know, you go to Stack Overflow and say, what happens when Stack Overflows? OK. So the idea is the callee, uh, the callee should not have any uh, unintended consequences. But what happens here is we had three registers that we have overwritten, and we shouldn't make that. So before we do anything strange, we say, OK, you know, before we start our procedure, we do the following. We go to the stack. The stack is somewhere here. Stack pointer points to it. And we say, let's make some room. And how much room do I want to make? Because I'm modifying three registers, I need to have room for three registers. So 12, uh, I need to change the address by 12. Every word is uh, four bytes, right? Three registers is 12 bytes. So let's make some room. So I uh, decrement the stack pointer by 12. So I go from here, one, two, three. I move this stack pointer to this position. Once I do this, I say, OK, I want to save a 0. So I write a 0 to stack pointer plus 8. So stack pointer is here. So this is plus 4. This is plus 8. This is plus 0. So here I write a 0. Then next. Uh, Plus four, I write T zero. And plus zero, I write dollar T one. So I move the registers that I'm going to destroy first to the stack. I put them there. Now I don't, I don't have to care about them anymore. I can do with those guys whatever I want. I say, ha ha, let's go. Let's add them up together. Dun, 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 destroy. And now I have my V zero, and I'm ready to return to the main uh, to the main routine, whoever called me. I want to go back. But before I go back, I load the data that I've put back into my registers. So I go and I say, hey, 
Stack pointer plus zero. This guy, I hope it's right, goes to T1. Then this guy goes to T0. This guy goes to S0, memory location, right? And then the last thing I do is I put the stack pointer back to here. It is as it was before, and now I can return. Nobody knows what I did on the stack. I, you know, I received it. Everything was nice. It's just like, you know, your parents go away. You throw a wild party in the house. Okay. The furniture has been moved out. Booze is brought in. Sorry, that was American movies of university life. It's not like that here. I know. Okay. So uh, whatever. You, you made some changes. And you can, you can live with those changes as you want. And then once you are done, uh, we just restore the data back. And we can continue. So this is the main trick what we do in the stack. So here you see also diff of sums. What I try to animate there is what exactly happens. So these are the addresses. To keep the examples shorter, uh, we are just using the last few, but the last byte of the exercise here uh, of the address here. I mean, there are 32-bit addresses, but I just use FC, F8, F4, F0 uh, has more. I saw two questions. Yes. We don't need to check if the stack is empty. The stack is where it is because we don't, I mean, the stack is not an absolute thing. At any given time, it's just a location where you can dump things. You know, it's just like, um, I don't know, I, I, I cannot come up with a good one. Like, you know, you have your jacket, you throw it on top of some other jackets. You don't care what those other jackets are, but once you're done, you take your jacket back. Hopefully you're not stealing from the other jackets, right? I mean, that's, that's the thing. You are not, um, maybe I'm using the wrong terminology. I mean, if, if you're in the assembly, you, you're just caring about your own registers and you just enter the function call and you need to, if you are destroying some registers, if you want to reuse some registers, you need to put them in a place for a short while, while you do your job, you put them there. You don't care what was there before. You know where the stack pointer is. You don't want to modify the stack pointer to a place where it wasn't. And you want to leave it as you have received it. That's the only thing you do. If you think about it, you can take the stack pointer, make modifications that do not affect whatever was on the stack, pile up as much as you want, take away as much as you want, and then you, know, you return. Uh, I will try to give an example, and hopefully it will be a good example. So this is where this lecture breaks or fails. Those are the two options. It either breaks or fails. <laughs> OK. Uh, how? <laughs> yes. So this, this, is, this goes then later to, to these things. At the moment, we are assuming that there is only one program active at a time. We are also assuming there was another question yesterday that these are physical addresses. When we continue in the lecture, we will see virtual addresses. And then later in your, if you are really into these things, into operating systems, you will see how stack is managed across multiple threads and, and things like that. So at the moment, we are keeping things very simple. On this processor, there are only physical addresses. So the moment you have an address, it's really where it is in the memory. And there is a single program running at a time. So we are not going back and forth like multiple programs, threads are not running at the same processor at the same time. It will not be more um, difficult. Principles will stay exactly the same. It's just how they are managed is not the part of the discussion right now. I mean, we can discuss about it. It's not my specialty. It will just make it a bit longer. When you say remove, so this is what I do. I modify the stack pointer. I point it down. I mean, like, if you just need to restore one that is 
not on the top of it or at the bottom, but in between somewhere. Do we have to restore every other value that is on top of it? Maybe I didn't get the question. We can, we, if, if we can do this in the break, uh, the idea is we are not putting anything on the stack if we don't need it. What's the point of using the stack? I mean, we are not just saying, hey, hello, here we came. Let's do a couple of operations that I don't know if you will ever need it or not. So we are only putting things on stack. Why? Because putting things on stack is not a fast operation. We have to go to the memory. And we already discussed that memory operations are very, very slow. So I am paying the price of going to the memory three times so that I can free up three registers. Now that I freed it up, hopefully I can do whatever I want to do and then come uh, back to, the, uh, to this thing. And before I go back, so this was the end of the procedure as I wanted it. This is the useful part. The blue part is just making space on the stack, moving things and taking it back. If you look at it, Let's be honest, right? Why do I subtract to S0? I could have just done this. this. This thing is redundant, right? This instruction here is redundant. It's for didactic purposes just to show you that we need it. I could have also not used uh, maybe T0. I could have added into A0. You know, we could have written this in assembly very differently. That's not the point here. It's just the principle will stay the same. Uh, this is the same for Intel, for ARM, for MIPS, for RIS-5. I love the questions. More? No. OK. So if you realize that we have so many registers, maybe we can come to an understanding. Because it's like ridiculous. I have so many registers. Why should I save every and each and every one of them? So you say, OK, you know what? Let's make sure that I save these registers. Don't touch them. Don't touch S0, S1, S2, S7, RA, SP, any stack above SP, whatever this points to, anything on the addresses above, don't touch it. But do whatever you want to T0, T9, A0, A3, V0, V1, and anything in the stack below it. That one is fair game. Now, this is a convention so that we don't unnecessarily have to move everything back and forth. In the previous example, we realized that if I needed three registers, I mean, I was like a little bit silly, right? Instead of using S0, I could have just stuck to these things and I wouldn't have needed to use the stack at all. As you can see, uh, when you go back to the function that I had here, the blue ones are just moving things around and this is the part that actually does the work, that does the computation. More specifically, it's this add, add, sub that really did something. This moved the register, this jumped back, and all the eight blue ones just moved things back and forth to the stack. And we are doing this, if you remember, for a, where was the function? For doing this useful work, which is this part. You know, this is the part that, when you're writing a code, this is the part that gets you excited, right? I'm, I'm calculating the difference of sums. Uh, it's a mathematical function. Well, I'm calculating uh, whatever, Bitcoin's next value in December 2024. Uh, so you have that function that makes the real job. All the rest is actually moving data back and forth. OK, mild interest. So when we come here, here's a question. Which of these registers may not be overwritten by default sums? Say V0 is OK. T, temporary, right? Temporary. And S is a saved register. That's why we call them S. Uh, so the S0 comes as saved. So saved register should have been preserved. Well, if you need to preserve it, and there is no way around it, I have nothing else. I really need that. I ran out of other meaningful things to do. and. <laughs> you know, my program is going to crash if I just don't have S0. Well, OK, I have to now make room for one on the stack, push S0, do whatever I need to do. And before I go back, let's restore the stack to where it was, and then restore S0 to whatever we, uh, we saved it to. OK? Now, the thing is, uh, if I have 
uh, multiple procedure calls, what happens? So if I'm already in a procedure which was called, the return address is telling me where I go back. So before I call any other function, I at least have to preserve what the return address is because I'm going to call an, uh, another function. And when I call another function, the return address will be overwritten. So the first thing that I do is, hey, let's put, make some space on the stack. Let's put the return address to the stack. And now we can call the procedure. Once we come back from the procedure, we can load back what the return address was because I don't, I don't remember who called me, who was it? So I go to the stack, I remember who called me, I restore the stack, and then I jump back. Okay? So now let's do something extremely fun. Okay? We are doing something extremely fun. So if I cannot finish it on time, we'll just postpone the break a bit, okay? Are we okay with that? I don't want to stop this. And this is going to be fun. We are going to do a recursive procedure call. We are going to calculate the factorial. And now the worst thing to do that I could do is ask you, hey, what factorial should we calculate? I'm not going to do that, okay? <laughs> so let's just first remember, so n factorial is uh, equal to one times two times n. And uh, what I will end up calculating is three factorial. I mean, I will have a factorial function that can calculate any factorial, but I will just want to calculate three factorial. So this is going to be one times two times three, which will be equal to six. So let's make sure that we know uh, we don't make any mistakes. And the way this function goes is written in a cute recursive way. Who likes recursive functions? Okay, somebody loves recursive functions. So I have a function called factorial, has an input n, and I check if the n is 1. If n is 1, if I'm calculating factorial of 1, then I can directly return 1. But if I'm not returning factor, if I'm not, if people don't ask me what's the factorial of 1, then I just go and call factorial n minus 1 and multiply it by n. Now, when, when I run this, if I say I want to run factorial 3, what will happen is, is, is uh, n, n is equal to 3. Is n larger than 1? Yes, it is. So I'm going to call, I'm going to say, OK, 3 times factorial 2 is 2 larger than 1? Yes, it is. So I'm going to say, OK, 2 times factorial 1 is 1. Yes. So I know that this is 1. So I'm going to multiply 1 by 2 by 3 and say the result is 6. So this is the way, hopefully, this function will work. And um, let's be very honest. Uh, this is not the smartest way to calculate factorials. You will never, I mean, if you're calculating small factorials, you will never do this way. And hopefully I didn't make a mistake already. Yes. Uh, I just noticed that we're doing this recursive uh, functions and stuff. Uh, we don't save the arguments, right? Doesn't that make some problems? No, we will save the arguments. No way. I have to save the arguments. Yeah. I will have to save. I will have to save everything. My life will be hell. Wasn't that in a non preserved like, process? Oh, wait. Um, let's do the following. Let me try to walk it through. OK? And then you can point out where I make mistakes. Is that OK? So this is the, trust me on this, somebody compiled it. And this is the function that it looks like. Now, I need to animate this somehow, and I will try to do this. Uh, so the slide and, and everything else is, is there. So we will come back to it. Don't worry. I'm not, I'm not making anything strange. So this is, our, this is my pointer now. Sorry, let me move it a bit straight so it doesn't. So uh, no. Come here. Yes. Excellent. It's not. 
Nice. Better. Okay. Good. So now let's agree on a couple of things. I'm your manual MIPS simulator. Okay. So now here, oh my God. Frank, what did you do? Here we have our stack. And the addresses in the stack are FC, F8, F4, F0, EC, E8, E4, E0, etc., etc. I have a stack pointer somewhere. My God. Ah, okay. Here, here's, here's the fun part for you. This is what we are going to do. I have three lives, okay? Okay, you win if I make three mistakes. I mean, you know, the third one, if I make the, uh, the fourth mistake, you win. Up to three mistakes, I, I have something. My God. Okay, so the stack pointer, uh, for all the pointers and addresses, I'm just going to use one byte. Obviously, these values are much larger just to make my life easier. I'm just going to use uh, this thing. And the stack pointer is pointing to FC at the moment. All numbers I write are hex, so I'm not writing 0x or something in front. Okay. And now what we will emulate is that we will be calling this factorial with an argument uh, that is going to be uh, three. Just because, you know, I hardly think I can make it. Uh, I mean, I'm not even sure if I can manage three, but we will try. And factorial one would be very boring. So this is the thing that we are calling, meaning that my argument will be uh, three. So let's not lie about this thing. So this is three. Okay. What else? Well, at some point, I need to have a return address and somebody called us. Okay. Whenever I, I reach the top of this code, when I'm at this very, very beginning, I jump to this address 0090 from somewhere. And there is a return address already. I'm just going to say this is return address. Okay, so that we remember what it is. What else should we think about? Well, if we have an argument, we also have a return value. So this is the V0. And at the moment, who knows what V0 is? So we still didn't calculate something. We just arrived here. There is maybe something in the V0. Uh, and of course, I forgot something, right? Frank, Frank, Frank. That's not an error yet. Oh, fuck. Uh, okay, I'll do this. That's not an error. <laughs> is it? Because I wanted also to have this dollar S zero. Uh, I use S zero, right? T zero. Okay. Well, okay. I don't need it actually. So let's just keep it like that. Okay. Are you ready? We are a fresh instruction. Uh, we are a fresh, fresh function, and we were called with the parameter. Uh, Three. So we were freshly called. So once we are done, we know where we are going back to. We don't know where it is. I mean, it could be anywhere for all I care. And I have my argument, which is three. I don't have a return value now. And my stack pointer is pointing to the top of the stack, which is, you know, this is essentially goes this way, comes in here. So the stack pointer is pointing now to the top of the stack. Okay. And what's the first thing that I do? The first thing that I do is saying, hey, 
I need more space on the stack pointer. So I'm making room. So the first instruction that I'm running is now going to modify this stack pointer. And we are going to make a change. Ah, here it is. <laughs> this is what I was looking. From FC, I'm going two down. And so my next, my stack pointer is now going to point to F4. OK. This is top of stack. So that we see that we are not doing something, something else. OK? That was my first course of action. Now my second course of action is here. And I say, you know what? I really, really want to store A0 because I'm going to modify it. I'm going to store A0 to SP plus 4. So stack pointer is pointing to F4. And I'm, I want to write to SP plus 4. So this is here. So I'm writing what is inside A0. A0 was, uh, this is the value that A0 was holding, 3. So I'm writing into this area, 3. So this was for A0, just so that we remember. This is going to take some time. Now, the next thing is, my return address, once I'm done, is this return. And soon, I'm going to call another function. The function, we already know what I'm going to call. I'm going to call factorial 2. Before I can call factorial 2, I have to make sure that I know what my return address is. So I'm going to copy this into sp plus 0. sp is pointing here. Still, it didn't change. So the return address, oh, wrench. The return address ends up here. OK. Now, I am using a temporary variable. variable. <laughs> I, I, I'm using this wrong. I'm sorry. So I'm just putting the value to here. Uh, I'm just using the value to here. I will use this for my comparison because I want to compare whether or not my argument, where is it? My argument, whether or not this is smaller than T0. It isn't, is it? It isn't. So T0, after this thing, will end up becoming 0. So we are, check we are at this point now. And we are checking branch is equal to T0 and the register 0, right? Do I branch or do I not branch? It is 0, so I'm branching. Where, is, where do I go? Well, I will jump to the else. Sorry, this is the address. Yes. I need to have a comparison. I want to see if the value is 1. Because if the value is 1, I'm going to do something else. right? So this was in the code when I say, hey, if I'm factorial 1, I'm going to do something else. If it's not factorial 1, I keep on calling factorial by decrementing n. So if I factorial 3, I'll call factorial 2. If it's factorial 2, I'm going to call factorial 1. If it's factorial 1, I'm going to do something else. Because I know that the value is 1, and I'll return it. So I need to make the comparison, is the, is the argument 1 or not? The way to make the comparison, in this case, I could have done it in a different way. But in this particular way, I use the temporary variable to load 2 into it and try to see if it's smaller than this. So if it's 2, it will not be less than. The only case where it will be less than will be 1. And then the next branch of equal will uh, not trigger. So far, I hope I didn't make a mistake. Usually, the funny part is the mistake comes up much later. Now, I jump to the else part, and I'm going to make a change. A0 is going to be no longer 
uh, A0, but it is going to be two. I decremented it now. Whew. Oh my God. And now comes the fun part. I'm going to jump back to factorial. Now the jump and link, that's the funny part. The jump and link, if, he, if I wasn't jumping, what would have been the next instruction? What's the address of the next instruction? The next instruction would have been BC. Do we agree? I mean, the address of the next instruction would have been BC. So when I do jump and link, I do two things. I will jump to the top, but I will modify the return address to be BC. So the return address now is BC. And execution continues from the top. So I go back to zoop here. And well, I start this process again. What do I do? Well, I need to decrement the stack pointer again by eight, F0, oh my God. Why do I do these things? Once I decrement it, the pointer now points to this part, earth, EC. So, I store A0 to stack pointer plus two, stack, point, stack pointer plus four. So this becomes two. And I store, now this is the fun part, I store the return address into the, where the stack pointer is uh, pointing. What's my return address? Well, the return address is BC. Great. Now I again make the comparison. Am I done? Can I, is it still zero? I didn't modify those things, I'm sorry. Okay, yes, so I end up again at the end else path. And now I modify this one. Now we are going a little bit faster, right? I modify this one, great. And I'm going to jump and link to the factorial. Now when I jump and link, the next instruction is going to be BC. So I overwrite the return address. And uh, the return address is going to be BC. Okay. And I jump now to this part. Okay. You all want a break. I know, I know, I'm, I'm going to go faster. Okay, okay, don't stress me. Now, the next one. Again, reduced by eight. So it's uh, E4. Stack pointer is going to point to E4. Uh, this one is going down here. And let's go a bit faster. Uh, we, we store the, ah, sorry. Ha! Da, 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 da. Nobody noticed it. <laughs> Back in the time <laughs> when I first jumped to the L's, the first thing I should have done was to increment, uh, no, I did that. <laughs> I'm just getting old. Okay, okay. I so much wanted to lose a life. So I have this one. My God. I'll finish it, okay, it won't take very long. The nice part is coming. I store the uh, return address, which is still BC. And now I come, and at this point, this point here, now T0 will be one. Why? Because A0 is one, it is less than two. My comparison 
uh, above will have overwritten t zero to be one, and uh, I no longer uh, I will I will realize that hey the set less than is is working so I jump on this one and now I say hey v zero v zero is going to be one. Okay, and now I say, you know what? I reserved all this stack pointer. I reduced it to E4. I no longer need it. I preemptively increase it. I'm going to just put it back where it was. So I'm going to make it back to EC. Here. And... I'm going to jump to the return address. That's the return address. The return address is BC. This is a tricky part. I'm going to jump to whatever is in the return address. The return address is still BC. So I'm going to go to BC and the operation moved now to BC. The first thing that I'm doing is I am returning the return address and I load it back into my return address. Now, interestingly enough, because we called it twice from the same location, this will again be BC, but I still you know, did overwrite it. I load A0 from this location. I pull it back because this was the one that I put back. And now A0 is going to be 2. And now I'm going to restore the stack pointer to where it was before. So this one is now going to point to F4. Is it? Yes. Now we are pointing to F4. And before we do anything, so this is a this is a slight fake. Slight fake, okay. Don't be upset with this one. I'm going to multiply A0 with V0 and write it back to V0. There is an instruction that we didn't discuss that's called multiply. And so this guy is now two. And now I'm going to jump to the return address. What's the return address? Well, the return address is BC. So this is where I'm jumping. So once I jump back to my return address, the first thing is I'm going to where the stack pointer is pointing to, F4, and I'm restoring the return address from there. And if you can see what is SP0 is, the return address that we originally had. The next one, I load A0 back. So that's sp stack pointer plus four. So this one. So this is three. I restore the stack pointer again. Go up again, eight. So it was F4. Now this is going to be FC. And this one, points now to the top of the stack. I do the multiplication three times two and write it back into V0. And I jump back to the return address. The return address is whoever called us from the beginning. I don't know where it is. It was already in the return address. There was a jump and link that called factorial three. And I have on my return, I have the correct function, and I use the stack back and forth. I put a number of things here, but when I return, the pointer, the stack pointer, points to where it was at the beginning. I have my result, and I didn't destroy any uh, saved register in the meantime. So I did my job, the function call is over, I have the correct result, six is, 
equal to the six. So we had factorial three called factorial two. This was one multiplied by two, multiplied by three, gave six, and that's it. So we did it. No. So now this is the, the switch. Yeah. This is a slide. Uh, for your reference, this is what hopefully happened here. And uh, it's time for a break. So let's continue at 20 past. I deserve a break. I don't know what you do. <laughs>
Okay, okay. So, I hope, now when you go back to the, uh, to the thing, uh, first of all, this is just an example. I like the example because it shows how stack could work. And it's a, when you just look at the code, you will first say, a lot of people would just say, ah, oh, yeah, I get it. It is a bit more tricky, so playing it through takes a bit of time. That's why I tried to do it on the board. Everything that we did is also on the slides, for those of you in July, uh, don't worry. And uh, here is just the uh, summary. The caller puts arguments in A0, A3, saves any registers that are needed, uh, because uh, you know, he, he, if, if the, the caller at the time is already making use of T0, T9, and uh, you know, the other guy can destroy them, so you might want to say these things. You jump to the callee, and once you come back from the callee, you restore it because you know, the, jump, the, the call has already been made, you stored whatever you wanted, and you look for the result in V0. So this is uh, what the idea is. Now, there was a question, and it makes actually a lot of sense. It's not like functions fall into two categories, either callers or callees. Because in a lot of cases, there will be a function, and that function will be called from somewhere. And in turn, he will call another function. And that one will call another function. That one will call another function. So that happens quite regularly, meaning that at the beginning of its life cycle, if you want, the, the, the function is a callee, and then after a while, the function itself becomes a caller and calls someone something else. And then there's another function who is a callee, has to do you know, all the uh, things, and you know, is on one side of this equation. And then the execution goes in the function and realizes, hey, I have to call another function. And so he becomes a caller again. So you go back and forth on these things uh, quite a bit. As a callee, you have to make sure that you are uh, saving the registers that could be uh, disturbed. Perform the procedure. If there is a result, you put it in uh, V0. Restore the registers to where they were. You know, reverse this thing, essentially. And then jump back to the return address. Now, any questions before we go on this one? So now I want to just round up some of the things. How do we find the operands? And we realize the first two ones are the easiest ones. I mean, if the data I'm looking for is in the register, I just use it. Nice. There are also sometimes constants we call immediates, and they are embedded into the instruction themselves. So every time we say add immediate uh, something two four, we already have them. And then uh, we have the... Uh, Base addressing, this is any time when we have a load word or a store word, we have a base address that's a register, uh, the stack pointer, something else, there a base address. And on top of the base, we are adding an immediate. And then we have what we will call the program counter relative addressing. We'll see that in a second. And we have direct addresses. Well, problem is, in the instructions, if you remember, I don't have enough space for the entire address. So it's pseudo direct. So it is almost direct with a couple of caveats. Now, here are they, once again, the operands are found in the register. So this is register only addressing. We have the immediate addressing where uh, we have an additional uh, constant that interacts with the uh, with two registers to form uh, some result. The base addressing is we have the base address and then the sign extended immediate. So when we say load word, uh, base address is zero plus 72, whatever that address, whatever is in that address, the content will be loaded into S4. Uh, the other one is the opposite way around. This one doesn't always have to be positive, although in most examples we had positive. It's like on the base, up or down, somewhere around it. In this case, minus 24. Uh, we will take T2, 
uh, this is our base address, and minus 24, I am writing it into there. Now, here is something that a lot of, uh, or that was causing a little bit of uh, uh, confusion, let's say. Uh, we weren't discussing this so much. Now, we, we say that this is going to be branch equal to T0 something, something else. So this, this is how it looks like, right? And uh, the, uh, the instruction above looks like that. What happens is, this is for our understanding. When you write it in machine code, you are not going to use ASCII labels like that, else, Frank, something like that. You're just going to say, instead of going to 14, this instruction is going to go to 20. So normally, when you execute the instruction that's at 10, uh, BEQ, the next instruction would have been 14. So that's where the program counter is normally pointing to. You say, if it's equal to, jump to else. And else has an address. In this case, it's 20. And you know where you are, and you are jumping that far ahead. In this case, you say, jump three words ahead. Yes? He does exactly this. He knows that, I, I mean, essentially you say jump to the instruction that says add i, right? <laughs> yes, so this is uh, when, when you write the code in assembly, I mean, let's first assume that we are writing in assembly. Uh, if you are writing in assembly, you, you don't write the addresses, right? You have this thing, and then you have an assembler. The assembler takes care of handling all these addresses, converts them, puts them, uh, turns them into machine code. And when he turns them into machine code, he's able to figure out where these labels are, what address this is. He knows what the normal address would be and can calculate the program counter relative address, not the absolute address. Says, you are here, now instead of branch not to the next address, but next address plus so many more or minus so many before. So this is what he does. And the mechanics of that is relatively simple, but it's the assembler stage that takes an assembly program written with, let's say, labels and variable, variables and things like that, and can map them to their actual locations in memory and initialize constants and things like that. And we have it in a machine, uh, in a human readable format to help us understand what is happening. So under the hood, once you write something like this, the assembler will convert this to three. It is three words after where he normally would have landed. The thing that could catch you out is uh, branch equal to is a 10. So normally you would think that he should go uh, four words ahead. However, the way to look at it is the program counter is already showing the next one internally. It's already ready to pick the next address. And the next address is 14. And I say, no, 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 it's not only 14. It is on top of that three additional. It's a convention. In MIPS, it's done this way. There are processors that could have done it differently. Does that? And so the encoding here, if you go to the... Uh, Ones and zeros would be this. Now, the fun one is, we didn't talk about these quite a lot, is this jump and link kind of story. When you ju say jump and link, you have a J-type instruction. Remember, we said there are three, two j jump instructions, and one of them is jump and link. Uh, remember that it had only a six-bit operation code, and uh, jump and link is, the operation is three, so it would make 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. And now I have a total of 26 bits to tell where the address is. Now, here's a problem. The address I want to jump is this, 0, 0, 40, 0, 0, A0. It's 32 bits. I only have 26. What shall I do? Now, ideally, you would want to put this entire address the 32-bit address, the jump target address, we say that, 
into the immediate. I can't because I made the sacrifice saying that all instructions should be 32 bits. Now we realize something. First of all, the last two bits are always zero. Why? Because I use byte addressing. I address every byte individually, meaning that if I go by words, if I go for 32-bit words, instructions, uh, the last two bits of the address are always zero. If I know they are always zero, there's no point in storing them. OK? I save two bits. I needed 32. Now I need only 30. And I have room for 26. And I say, OK, what will I do with the uppermost four bits? You say, you know what? We know where we were. We know what the next address would have been. Just take the address from there. Assume that it's in the vicinity. OK? Is that clear what he does? It's pseudo direct. You are, you look at for the first four bits, which is the first number, first hex number, just use the current address. Just use what, where you are currently. It's very unlikely that when you are running a program and you want to jump, you will jump, uh, what is this, uh, uh, 512 billion addresses away. Most probably, the next instructions are somewhere, let's say, within a few hundred thousand uh, instructions around. Even if you have the Linux kernel, it's not that big. What is it? It's a compromise that you are saying, OK, you know what? I'll sacrifice it. I'll do it. Yes? What is it if the address you're coming from is always zero, except for the first four bits, and you want to jump the bar? Yeah, you know, there, is, there are ways to go over it. What would we do? We have an instruction called jump register. And I could load into the register any address I want. So I would uh, you know, load upper immediate first 16 bits. Then I would or immediate the next 16 bits. And then I can jump register to there. Problem with that is it is three instructions. So if I really, really, I mean, if this really, 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 really is needed, that's the principle about uh, how they designed the risk architecture. Say, you know what? For 99.99999% of the time, this is what, what is enough. I don't need to go crazy for those four bits. And if you know, there is some person that insists on happening, there's a way to solve it. Instead of one instruction, you execute three instructions. It's a fair deal, I would say. OK, great. So these are our addressing uh, No. So what happens now in the entire compilation flow? Let's talk a little bit about it. In most of the cases, you have your high-level code. This could be C, C++, Rust, whatever. And you have a compiler that, in the end, will take uh, your code and turn it into assembly code, into the assembly code of your choice. We call it a cross-compiler when you are compiling on, let's say, an Intel machine, code that would run on a MIPS machine. That's also possible. It's all a compiler. It generates ones and zeros. It can generate ones and zeros for Intel, can generate ones and zeros for ARM, can generate ones and zeros for whatever architecture you want. Uh, so if you are compiling on the same architecture, which is most of the times the case, uh, then you just say compiler. You would call it a cross-compiler when you compile on one architecture something for another architecture, saying on an Intel machine, you can also compile a code that would run on the MIPS. Now, out comes an assembly. And uh, the assembly code will then go to an assembler, which will create an object file. Uh, it is a little bit funny because um, there is already a lot of code. There's a lot of functions that you do not write yourself. So if you are, uh, my knowledge is not very good in programming. It will show. But if you call at some point, write a printf, for example, that function is not something you have written. That function was already written somewhere. And uh, that is in a library. And there are other object files that were pre-compiled that does what printf function call is supposed to do. That is compiled stand somewhere. 
what, what then has to be is your part of the code has to be merged with all the other pieces of code together so that when you call printf, you don't say, hey, I didn't write this. You say, hey, you know, that's printf, you know, our friend. And the linker puts things together. And the linker also, once you call it, uh, you know, there, there was a question, how do you know where this, this label is, right? So we were asking. So it's linker that will uh, find out where the various pieces are and can correct those labels with the real physical values and can create an executable. Now the executable will then go into a loader. The loader's job is to say, aha, uh -huh, he wants to run Google Chrome. Let's take the Google Chrome, load it into the memory, and uh, point to the beginning of Google Chrome, whatever, and let's go. So this is what is happening in the, in the back end. Okay, lots of questioning. Oops, ah, good. So what needs to be stored in the memory? First of all, we need to have the program, the instructions themselves. Uh, historically, this has been called text. So whenever you're talking with people who write linkers, they say, what's the text segment? Where are the things? So when they talk about text, what they mean is actually uh, the program itself, uh, the, the assembly instructions, the compiled program, where does it go? Now we have data and some of my data is uh, global, meaning that the, the data is there when the program starts. We know what the values are, we know their initial values, we know where they are located. And then the other one is dynamic, which means that we start the program and then depending on what we need, we need to allocate a certain amount of memory and we say something. For example, you have an application that goes to a disk, loads a disk image, a homework, something like that. Well, files have different sizes, images have different resolutions. So when you want to load it, you don't know while you compile the program how large these things will be. So you have routines that, let's say, examine the file. You know, you, you go, dear disk, I want to load a JPEG and says, hey, dude, this is 1,000 by 1,000. Says, okay, let me allocate enough memory to have this thing. So these things are at runtime, they are dynamic. Uh, so they are allocated within the program. Now, I have a lot of memory. If you were a, a processor person in the 2000s, having a 32-bit address range was sweet. 32 bits, it's 4 billion addresses, you know, 4 gigabytes of memory. <laughs> you, you know, uh, there, there was a time where people were saying 640 kilobytes of memory should be enough for everyone. This is when Microsoft uh, DOS, MS-DOS first came out. So that, that was one of those famous things. And so once you made the jump from those sizes, a couple of megabytes to four gigabytes, it sounded like infinite. Uh, these days, most computing systems have 64 bits. So the addressable range is four billion times four billion. At the moment, nobody, I mean, everybody thinks this is a lot. Maybe in a couple of years, we'll be making fun of people who thought 64-bit address range was ridiculous. But let's say with the 32-bit, you know, let's say humble and small, we're gonna have 32 addresses, two to the 32 uh, makes four gigabytes bytes, one giga words, four gigabyte memory. Now, the address range from 32 bits goes all the way from zero to FFF. And uh, usually when you have that much memory in the beginning, people start and saying, okay, let's I agree on some conventions. There's so much memory, let's parcelize this and let's assign parts of the memory for special things. They say, for example, this entire range, which starts from uh, 400, should be where the text is located. So let's load our programs into this region. Any static data, let's put it from 10 to this thing. 
to 100 FFC. They said this should be enough for most cases. And then half of the memory, you, you see from 0x8000, uh, half of the memory, we say, this is reserved. OK, let's not touch it. And then the bottom part, let's also keep this reserved. Let's not touch it. And then we say, you know, that should be the top of the stack is that address. And here is the static data. And the ones that I, you know, push and pop to the stack back and forth uh, grows down from the top. And then the other one that I was talking about, the dynamically allocated memory through the program while running is called the heap memory. And that one grows on top of the st static data. These are all conventions. In terms of the processor, in terms of the physical structure of the memory, the memory doesn't care if he's holding the ones and zeros that correspond to the stack, doesn't care if it holds the ones and zeros that correspond to the program or variables or, or anything else. Uh, this allows such conventions allow programs to be ported between different people, different organizations, so that you can have an ecosystem, a software ecosystem that programs, libraries, object files compiled by different people when they come together work properly. Now, here is a very, very simple example just to see in a high level code uh, where we have a main function where I have uh, three variables, f, g, and y, I call a function, that function doesn't do much, but still returns something, how that thing ends up in the memory, okay? It's a very small example, should illustrate what is happening. Now, we have two different segments, actually. We have the data segment, because we know that we will be using F, G, and Y, and these things will end up being a value somewhere in the memory. I know I've written the program and I'm making references to F, G, and Y. If I'm doing this, this means that these are some static variables that I will be needing at some point in time. So I say, this is my data and let me reserve some space. Let F, G, and Y have an address somewhere in the memory space that I have allocated so that I can access them through a register. Now the rest is the part that ends up getting compiled. So this code, very similar to the recursion thing, now we know that, hey, I can do function calls, I can do A plus B, I can do things, and you will realize, ah, oh, what am I doing? Saving the return address, uh, you know, modifying the stack pointer, saving the return address, uh, loading F, loading this, uh, jump and link to sum, add these things, return address, do this, do this, finish, uh, and then return. And notice that here I have all labels. I say Y, I say F, I uh, call uh, sum, sum is somewhere. You know, they don't have yet physical things. They're all labels. I, I believe that was your question, right? And now what happens is the... Uh, for this uh, program, we look at these things once we compile it, and we say, okay, let's create a symbol table. Which symbol, which alphanumerical symbol that the programmer used corresponds to what address? I have all the freedom in the world. There's a huge memory. And I say, let F be at this address. Let G be at this address. Let Y be at this address. I'm like this, ha, I have all these addresses. Where shall I put it? And then this is the start of the program, and this is the next one. And you know, I just count and say, hey, these are the locations it should go to. Now, when I'm coming back, I can start putting things together. First of all, let me start here at the bottom. I say, I have a data segment of this program, and at the address this, the data will be what I call F. This will be what I call G. This will be what I will call Y. And uh, at the beginning, I have some header that says how large is the text size. I mean, how much of the data that I'm reading in will correspond to the text? How much of it will correspond to the data? And this thing now has been, uh, has been uh, modified 
so that I have the addresses. Now, look at the way that we are playing with this. I have already initialized the pointer. The pointer, because I know where these things are going, right? I can initialize some of the uh, pointers to point to the static, static data location and uh, generate the addresses accordingly. Sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Here. Here, here, here. So one of them is F, one of them is G, the other one is Y. F, G, Y. And the locations when I am jumping back and forth, where is the uh, jump and link? For example, the jump and link, I know that I will be jumping to the uh, address which re uh, corresponds to 2C, to 2C, to 2C. To I'll be jumping to this location, and this is the instruction which is there. I can replace those labels, those symbols, with their values. Why? Because I have the symbol table. Whatever is sum is going to be this. Whatever is y is going to be this. And now I can go and the loader's job is to take this executable and put them to the right place. The text will be put here to the very beginning. The uh, GP has been initialized to this value. And I remember that this YGF was being referenced uh, relative to that GP. I, the stack pointer has been initialized to the top of the stack. And I don't have anything on the heap at the moment. And here is my program. And this is the first instruction, the 23BDFFC. Let's just go back. Uh, sorry. Ugh. The one at the top, 2, 3, B, D, F, F, C. So add E, S, P, S, P minus 4, right? That's the first instruction that ends up here. Now, when I release the reset, when I, after I've initialized the memory, after I've loaded my executable and my data into the memory, I can let the program counter lose on this point, the first thing is going to do, well, that was the um, make space on the stack pointer, save the return address, do this, do that, and we continue. Questions? I really like someone zoned out really seriously. Okay. <laughs> okay. So some odds and ends to close this lecture. Don't worry, don't worry, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> I would do the same. <laughs> so the instructions, we saw one in a few seconds. Exceptions, I'm not going to talk too much about sign, unsigned, and floating point instructions, but there are some more instructions that come into the MIPS. It shouldn't make you uh, so much uh, interesting. So we saw a couple of funny instructions that actually are not part of the MIPS, but they are sort of instructions because they are used so commonly, they have a direct um, translation. The first one we saw is load immediate. So you can load immediate a 32-bit value. The moment you write this, the assembler is just going to convert it to load upper immediate and or immediate. The same way as multiply, not going to go into the details, uh, there are two instructions. Uh, one of them is for the overflow and, uh, you know, yeah, <laughs> the, the multiplication has actually, uh, if you multiply two 32-bit numbers, you get a 64-bit result, right? So you need one more step to take care of things there. Clear, if you want to, uh, you know, erase, if you want T0, well, you can add, zero to zero and right back to T zero. So that's a convention. The same way if you want to move the content of S2 into S1, this is what you do. You know, you add zero to S1 and write it to S2. Yes. Because they are too complex. So that was the, when you go back, uh, beginning of last lecture, when we were talking about things, we said the basic idea is to keep things simple. Don't implement too many instructions, but implement those instructions really well. 
So things that we don't use so often, my God, let, let them be implemented in a couple of different instructions. Sorry? Uh, there is a question on Zoom. Okay. So in this slide, there are extra instructions to jump to a 32-bit address. AUIPC plus JAIR is normally used. Is there something similar in MIPS or is this a of at most time addresses won't be far away used and why is that performance simplification? Well, as far as I, uh, let me try to see. <laughs> the question was much longer than I thought it would be. Uh, let me try to. <laughs> Usually it's like, hey, Frank, how are you doing? Fine. Oh, my God. <laughs> Phil. This why there are any sense to jump to? Yeah. Yes. The, the, the basic, let's, let's make it simple. The idea was to keep things simple and uh, implement the most common case uh, in the most easy way and fashion. And then for the others, we will take the hit. And then when you implement something new, you have years of experience. So the, the cool thing about this five is uh, they started in 2010. That's about, I mean, you know, the first processors came out in 70s, let's say. Uh, that gives them a good 40 years of experience of what was a good idea, what was a bad idea. So they were able to pick up things and uh, argue things uh, more. Also, RISC V has the option of add-ons and additions and uh, options where you can optimize things much. Is this seriously of at most times won't be far away used? Yeah. So th the guiding principle in MIPS was let's only use 32 bits and let's make some sacrifices. Now, in the when you come to the RISC V times, which is another 20 years later, uh, people may have decided that they want to do something else. It's feel okay? I think so. Don't you think he's okay? I think he's okay. Okay, now another fun part is exceptions. And this came as a question a number of times. What happens when this, what happens when that? There are cases where things don't go according to plan. And uh, we... Uh, we may want to interrupt the current flow of the program because something happened. This could be an interrupt, which is a user, which is a timer that is telling us, hey, every 10 milliseconds, let's do something. Or oh, somebody pressed the keyboard, let's go to the next slide or something like that. Or it could be something. For example, we have received an instruction that doesn't make any sense. We have done an operation that cannot be calculated, divide by zero. What shall I do? I mean. This guy is wanting the impossible. In this case, uh, the processor will have an exception. It says, okay, okay, let's take a deep breath. Let's stop what is happening. I, maybe from different causes, I know what caused the exception. There are different parts of the computing system, and one part may have caused us an exception. Let's record this. Let's save the state. And there is a specific part, which is the exception handler. Let's jump there and let that guy take care of things. So my execution at any point can be interrupted, and I jump to this exception handler. The guy is there and says, OK, OK, hold on. Nothing is going on. Let me just save all the registers. What is happening? What was the cause? Why did you wake me up? And can try to uh, negotiate these things. For that, uh, they would have uh, separate uh, register files to record the cause of the exception. There's an exception program handler so that the regular program handler is not being uh, modified. And then there are a number of things that this thing can do. Now, there are a number of things that we had uh, in MIPS already causes. So there's a hardware interrupt, uh, something in the hardware, a timer, for example, came out. A system call, the operating system is asking something for a change in the thing. There's a breakpoint, divide by zero. An instruction came that I don't know how to handle. Remember that I have a certain number of oper operation codes, function codes. Not all of them are defined. Some of them are yet undefined, or the processor doesn't know what to do. It and says, like, 
say, what, what is this? And I say, I'll just go to the exception handler and he'll take care of that. Could also be an arithmetic overflow. Now, this is what happens. Uh, the processor will save the calls and the exception program counter in, the, in those registers and jumps, jumps to the handler. He saves all the registers on stack, reads the calls register, handles as best as it can the exception. One of the famous handling cases is, who remembers the blue screen of that? That's the way of handling it, you know? The other one is completely crashing in the middle and rebooting. Well, that's handling it very badly, right? Uh, normally what it says, hey, program not responding, what should I do? Or, you know, falls back to something, finds a, a appropriate solution. It requires that somebody has thought of this exception and knows what to do. Restores the registers and jumps back to the program. This actually covers now what I wanted to talk about, the programming part of MIPS. I hope I could convince you that with those silly little instructions, load word, stored word, add immediate, uh, add or whatever, those small things, we can actually make a lot of programs, meaningful things, things that we are familiar with. Uh, this is by far not the complete way of um, explaining what goes under the hood. You will have plenty of opportunities to do this. Next week, we will start building a hardware that can actually read from the memory and make these instructions come to life. So we will, real, we will talk about what does it take for an R-type instruction to be executed? What do we need? How do we put this together? So we will slowly start drawing and building our processor on the blackboard or on the slides. And uh, we will finish that. We will talk about how fast it is, how good it is. And then in the following weeks, we will argue and show you how we can make things faster. We will make the execution faster. Then we will come back to this entire story of going to the memory is extremely slow. Well, maybe we can fake it. And Otterberg is the king of fakes. So he will show you how to build uh, cache system so that memories appear to be faster. And then we will go into more and more complex processor architectures, the things that end up being in your uh, computers, laptops, cell phones. And hopefully that will lead to the conclusion of the lecture. So thanks a lot for joining me. Next week, we build a processor. <laughs>